In seeking the origins of the Panther, regarded as one of the finest medium tanks of the Second World War, we must turn back to examine the consequences for the German army, and in particular the tank arm, of Hitler's momentous decision to order the Wehrmacht eastward against the Soviet Union. At 0300 hours on June 22, 1941, the eastern horizon from the Baltic coast to the foothills of the Carpathian Mountains was lit up by the fire from a barrage of 6,000 heavy guns, providing the overture to Operation Barbarossa, the German assault on the Soviet Union, and the greatest land invasion in history. Three million men with 3,350 tanks and supported by some 2,000 aircraft of the Luftwaffe poured across the frontier, bent on employing the now well-tested Blitzkrieg formula to defeat the USSR in a rapid campaign which Adolf Hitler expected to last no more than a few months. The dictator of Nazi Germany viewed the Soviet Union with derision claiming its image as a powerful modern state was a sham. He said, we have only to kick in the front door and the whole rotten structure will come tumbling down. Such delusion, while grounded in the first instance on his anti-Semitic, anti-Marxist and overtly racist philosophy, which reduced the Slavs, and thus the Russians, to the level of mere subhumans in the Nazi worldview, was also heavily coloured by a German intelligence analysis of Soviet military and economic power that was profoundly flawed. This analysis, which underlay German planning for Barbarossa, was remarkable more for what it did not know about this new enemy than what it did. Thus numbers of aircraft and tanks in Soviet service were not known. Figures proffered being mere guesses. Little was known of the Soviet order of battle or of the detailed organization of Soviet military formations. Nor had the Germans any inkling of the profound changes wrought on Soviet industry by the five-year plans and thus of the potential of the USSR to fight a prolonged war. In short, the German armed forces had plunged into war with the Soviet Union, sustained only by the unsubstantiated conviction that the Red Army was not fit to engage in a modern conflict and would be unable to defend itself against the most modern and effective war machine in existence. And yet, all that happened in the opening months of the campaign seemed to substantiate German beliefs about the state of the Red Army and the nature of the Soviet state. Unbeknown to the Germans, however, they had chosen to attack at the worst possible moment for the Soviet Union. The Red Army was not only attempting to recover from the impact of the devastating effect of the purges that had decimated the Soviet officer corps, but also from the shame of its performance in the Winter War against Finland. In June 1941, it was also in the throes of massive internal change, including a huge re-equipment programme. Although the German panzer columns tore through the Soviet defences, driving deep into the hinterland and encircling hundreds of thousands of Russian troops in massive pockets within weeks of the opening of the campaign, there were more than a few indications that led many Germans to realise that this new war in the East would be quite unlike that fought the summer before. One officer in the 18th Panzer Division wrote, There was no feeling, as there had been in France, of entry into a defeated nation. Instead, there was resistance, always resistance, however hopeless. Indeed, even Hitler sensed as much, telling Mussolini that Soviet soldiers fought with truly stupid fanaticism, with the primitive brutality of an animal that sees itself trapped. 
while the Fuhrer, no doubt, saw such as confirming evidence of the subhuman nature of the Russians, even he could not have missed that these same subhumans had already killed over 100,000 German troops in the opening weeks of Barbarossa, more than in all the previous campaigns combined. Nor were the Germans oblivious to the seemingly endless numbers of Soviet divisions that made their appearance on the battlefield, only to be fed into the German mincing machine, then replaced by more. By the end of July, the Germans had already identified more Soviet divisions than the estimated the Red Army possessed. The Soviets were profligate with their manpower, but in the face of the rapidity of the German advance and their unpreparedness to cope with Blitzkrieg, they had to trade lives and space for time thousands and thousands, then hundreds of thousands of prisoners were taken. One German soldier later recalled, the earth-brown crocodile slowly shuffled down the road towards us. Prisoners of war, Russians, six deep. We couldn't see the end of the column. As they drew near, the terrible stench which met us made us feel quite sick. We made haste out of the way of the foul cloud which surrounded them. Then what we saw transfixed us where we stood and we forgot our nausea. Were these really human beings, those grey-brown figures, those shadows lurching towards us, stumbling and staggering, moving shapes at their last gasp, creatures which only some flicker of the will to live enabled them to obey the order to march? July the 16th, less than a month after the beginning of Barbarossa, the city of Smolensk, just 200 miles from Moscow, fell to the panzers of Generals Hoth and Guderian. In their drive eastward, German armour had brushed aside or destroyed large numbers of Soviet tanks. Guderian had estimated before the start of the campaign that the Red Army possessed a tank park of about 10,000 machines, and this was the benchmark accepted by the army. However, it was becoming all too clear that this figure was much too small and that the real figure was in excess of some 20,000 tanks. Hitler later stated to Guderian that had he known Russian tank strengths would have been as large, he would have seriously reconsidered his decision to invade Russia. Numbers, though, did not equal quality. By far and away, the bulk of Soviet armour was obsolete. Most of the designs dated back to the early 30s, drawing heavily on foreign designs. What the newsreels show the most of are wrecked and burning T-26s, T-28s, T-37s, and light tanks of the BT series. None mounted a gun larger than 45 millimeters, and all had thin armor. The short-barreled 50 millimeter gun of the Panzer Mark III and the short 75 millimeter gun of the Panzer IV had no difficulty destroying these tanks, and the footage herein shows large numbers of these tanks destroyed and on fire. Even the 20 millimeter cannon of the Panzer II light tank and the 37mm gun on the Panzer 38T had no difficulty taking out these light Soviet designs. Even the large and impressive T-35 multi-turreted tank seen here was highly vulnerable to German fire. But amid this welter of obsolescence, there were a number of new designs that sent shockwaves through the Panzerwaffe. In the KV-1 and KV-2, the Soviets had two machines technologically superior to any German tank. With armour as thick as that encountered on the British Matilda, and heavy armament as well, in the case of the KV-1, a 76mm gun, and on the KV-2, a 152mm howitzer, these were truly formidable machines. Shells from German tanks bounced off the armour of these monsters. But it was the T-34 that made the greatest impression. Fast, weighing some 26 tonnes, with well-sloped heavy armour, and carrying a 76mm gun, it came as a revelation to the German tankers. Luckily, it was only available in small numbers and poorly employed. 
The T-34 being examined here is the earliest model coming off the production line in 1940. As in France, when dealing with the heavily armoured British and French tanks, the 88mm flat gun was found to be able to deal with the new Soviet tank designs. German infantry found other methods for destroying T-34s and KVs. Satchel charges were placed on the Soviet machines, although this required great nerve as a soldier had to run up to the tank in order to deposit the charge on the engine deck or wedge it below the turret overhang. Such methods were quite often the only fallback in the absence of an effective anti-tank gun, the 37mm gun proving totally useless as it was unable to penetrate the Soviet tank's armour. It was only with the launch of Operation Typhoon, the German offensive to capture Moscow, in late September 1941, that the T-34 became a real threat to the Panzers. With the onset of the Rasputitsa, the period of rains before the start of winter, and which turned Russian roads into quagmires, the German Panzers sank up to their axles because of their narrow tracks, whereas the T-34 coped with the conditions because theirs were much broader. At Medzensk on the 4th of October, T-34s operated in large numbers for the first time, inflicting heavy casualties on the Panzer 3s of the 4th Panzer Division. Guderian was later to comment that it was at the Battle of Medzensk that for the first time the vast superiority of the T-34 became plainly apparent to the Germans. And when Typhoon finally ground to an exhausted halt at the beginning of December, large numbers of T-34s belonging to the fresh divisions and trained from Siberia led the Soviet counteroffensive in front of Moscow on December the 5th, 1941. By then it had become apparent to the German army that it had to take steps to address the clear technological superiority and tank design possessed by the Soviets and represented in the T-34. In October, a Panzer Commission met with General Heinz Guderian at Orel in Russia to consider ways of responding to the T-34. In addition to continuing development of the heavy Tiger tank, the decision was taken to proceed with production of a new medium Panzer under the designation VK-3002, contracts for which were issued within days of the return to Germany. The initially favoured design from Daimler-Benz clearly reflected the influence of the T-34, with heavily sloping armour and turret mounted far forward on the hull. On May the 15th, 1942, Hitler acceded to the recommendations of a report that favoured production of the alternative design submission from the Mann Company. The prototype Mann Panther incorporated the many changes foisted on the design team in the course of the new Panzer's development. Weight had grown to 45 tonnes, and the tank now mounted the longer and more formidable 75mm L70 gun. Contracts were issued in September 1942 for a 1,000 Panthers, with the first leaving the man works in January 1943. Parallel production lines were set up with Daimler-Benz, MNH, and are seen in this still at Henschelhoff Castle. It was at the latter concern that a very brief glimpse of one of the new Panther medium tanks, seen just beyond the target in the foreground, was captured on newsreel in May 1943. The new Panther had a very short gestation period, from drawing board to production line in just over a year. There was much optimism that this new tank would provide the Panzerwaffe with the technical edge on the Eastern Front it had hitherto lacked. The first model of the Panther was the Type D, identifiable by its drum type commander's cupola with lid hatch and machine gun flap on the left side of the glacis. In other respects, such as armour thickness, it was to remain the same on all preceding models. 80mm for the frontal plate, 120mm for the gun mantlet and 40mm on the sides. The early Model A mounted a new turret with a cast cupola with seven periscopes. The later A saw the introduction of the machine gun ball mount in the Glacis. Introduced in March 1944 was the G, which was to remain in production until war's end. 
The combat debut of the Panther during Operation Citadel in July 1943 was decidedly inauspicious. This last German offensive in the East was meant to be a limited affair, fought over a very restricted geographical area and rapidly concluded. But in terms of the actual number of tanks and forces allocated, it was a major commitment of scarce resources at a time when the scope of the war was widening dramatically. In part, it was to address this quandary that Citadel was launched. The task of the offensive was to destroy the great Soviet salient at Kursk and eliminate the vast Soviet forces therein, thus shortening the front line and freeing up panzer divisions for transfer to the west to deal with the expected Allied landings on the mainland of Europe. Originally planned for the spring, Zitadel was repeatedly delayed to allow for adequate numbers of Ferdinand assault guns and Tiger and Panther tanks to be assembled. For Hitler believed that only with their presence in sizable numbers could a favourable outcome for the battle be assured. No footage exists of the approximately 200 Panthers committed to the offensive. Organised into tank battalions 51 and 52, and under the command of Major von Lauchert, the Panther Regiment was subordinated to the Gross Deutschland Division during Citadel. On paper, the Panther Regiment represented the most powerful armoured unit at Kursk, but its effectiveness was to be severely inhibited by its premature commitment to battle. Although raised at the beginning of 1943, the two battalions suffered so many problems with their Panthers that most of them were returned to the factories for overhaul or rebuilding. Guderian, now Inspector General of Armoured Troops, called the Panther our problem child, for it was a maintenance nightmare, the inevitable fruits of a very hasty development and production schedule. Even the crews did not receive the time to fully train on their new charges. Five days into the offensive, there were only 10 Panthers operational. Although just 25 had been destroyed, 100 had broken down. While the frontal armour had proven effective, the 40mm side armour was shown to be vulnerable to Soviet anti-tank fire, many Panthers being lost in this fashion. Nevertheless, the 75mm gun was shown to be highly effective, destroying T-34s at 3,000 metres. As the production tempo increased, more Panther battalions were being raised and hastily deployed to combat the growing power of the Red Army, which having wrested the military initiative at Kursk, was in the months after the battle pushing the Germans back all along the southern part of the front. By October, there were five Army and SS Panther battalions in action in Russia, with others coming on stream in November. The furious pace of operations and continuing technical problems led to high losses, and of the total of 841 Panthers deployed to the Eastern Front in 1943, only 80 out of an available 217 were actually operational on December the 31st, some 624 machines having been lost in combat since July. Nevertheless, it was only in March of 1944 that Guderian declared the Panther fully combat capable. Throughout the winter of 1943-44, the Red Army launched a series of hammer blows against Army Group South, whereby the German lines were frequently breached. The Panzer divisions found themselves in the role of fire brigades, rushed from one point to another to contest each new Soviet breakthrough. Extemporised battle groups comprised of elements from different units, with integral all-armed support were often raised to deal with such contingencies. One such was Heavy Panzer Regiment Becker, which had 47 Panthers and 34 Tigers, and was employed as the point of an armoured relief column assembled in early February 1944 to punch a corridor through to 60,000 German troops encircled around Cherkassy. Mid-March 1944, four Soviet rifle divisions, supported by a number of tank units, encircled the German battle group under the command of SS Gruppenführer Herbert Giller in the town of Kovel, a major rail centre for European Russia and of great strategic importance to both sides. A relief force was assembled by the Germans, which included elements from the 4th Panzer Division and was led by a company from the Panther Regiment of the 5th SS Panzer Division Viking under the command of Obersturmführer Nikolusi Lech. The German attack was hampered by the boggy ground that surrounded the town and which made for excellent defensive cover for the Soviets. The only firm ground available to the Panthers 
lay on the upraised railway embankment which led into Covell. At 0400 hours on the 30th of March, Nicolucci Leck advanced along the embankment with nine panthers, but then almost immediately lost two to mines. The mines were cleared by following infantry, but it was not until the evening that the panthers finally broke into the town to strengthen the defenders. For his leadership, Nicolucci Leck was awarded the Knight's Cross. A number of panthers had been abandoned along the embankment, victims of mines and Soviet anti-tank fire, including this Befeil's panther, or command panther, identifiable by the second aerial mounted on the rear of the hull. After the battle, the Germans used captured Soviet prisoners to help recover the knocked out panthers, most of which were repaired and returned to service. Also recovered were the bodies of the dead crewmen, who had been so rapidly interred in the sandy soil between the railway lines alongside their abandoned charges. Covell was finally relieved on April 5th by a further attack involving Panzer IVs and assault guns from the 3rd Panzer Division, along with other Panthers from Viking. These broke through the strong Soviet defences, covering the northern approach to the town along the Covell Breslatov Road. Anti tank positions were destroyed and overrun, and Soviet tanks, including American Sherman supplied under lend lease, were knocked out on the drive into the town. At the end of August 1944, the Soviet summer offensive had all but destroyed Army Group Center and carried the Red Army to the borders of Poland. It was here that a propaganda company film team recorded footage of heavy fighting as the Germans desperately attempted to halt the Soviet drive westward. By this stage of the war, Waffen SS units were given particular prominence when filming, and on this occasion the PK team had focused on a localized counterattack by the 5th SS Panzer Division Viking. Under the command of Sturmbahn Führer Maedres, elements of the Panther Battalion, supported by Panzer IVs, deployed to attack an advanced Soviet armored unit of T-3485s and JS-2 tanks that have occupied a number of nearby villages. Fire is opened on the Soviet positions by Vespa and Hummel self propel guns. The Panthers begin to move towards the target using their speed to move rapidly from one fire position to the next. Grenadiers then follow up in their armoured half-tracks, ready to mop up Soviet infantry in advanced positions. Panthers engage Soviet armour, while the Grenadiers move forward to flush out other Soviet infantry that have gone to ground in the cornfields. As the infantry advances through the first burning settlement, SS Gruppenführer Giller, commander of the 4th SS Panzer Corps that carries his name, holds a rapid orders group to determine the next objectives on the unfolding attack. A reconnaissance detachment of Volkswagen Schwimmwagens and one-ton half-tracks move out to scout ahead of the infantry, who now fan out across the wide and unbroken wheat and maize fields. Half-tracks follow up advancing Panthers, who roam across the fields completely devoid of any cover, it is the measure of the secondary role played by air power on the Eastern Front that German armour could still operate in this fashion underneath a sky empty of Soviet aircraft, while far away in Normandy such an operation would have caught the immediate attention of Allied fighter bombers. Vikings Hummel detachment has moved up and brings other Soviet positions under fire from their 150 meter guns. Panther commanders now scan the next village to determine targets and tactics. Fire is then opened and shortly thereafter Viking grenadiers enter the village to find a large number of destroyed and fiercely burning T-3485s and JS-2s. The latter was a heavy tank introduced in the spring of 1944. Its 122mm gun was one of the few weapons that could easily penetrate the frontal armour of the Panther. But the very high muzzle velocity of the 75mm L-71 gun still allowed the Panther to effect a first round hit and penetrate the turret armour of the Soviet heavy tank at 800 metres. As this distance was clearly a long way within the range of the Russian tank's heavy gun, other factors such as training, the quality of German optics and command and control procedures went into play in order to bring about the sort of results seen in this footage. Even though German armoured units continued to inflict heavy casualties on the Soviet tank arm, they were never enough to dent the immense numbers being turned out of Soviet factories to replace them.
Further to the north, the 3rd Panzer Army, having been pushed back into Latvia and Lithuania by the 1st and 2nd Baltic fronts, was engaged in fierce defensive fighting. Panther battalions fought alongside Tiger companies, and the footage even gives a glimpse of a couple of surviving Panzer III's and early Mark IVs. The limited counterattacks being undertaken by these German units, though successful in eliminating local breakthroughs, had no impact on the wider picture. Soviet pressure continued to build, and within a matter of weeks, 3rd Panzer Army was fighting in East Prussia, with 16th Army holed up in Kurland. Nevertheless, in the tank battles fought by Panther crews, there must have been many occasions when others did what this crew was doing, acknowledging their good fortune and offering up thanks to Krupps for the effectiveness of their armour plate. On the 6th of June 1944, the long-awaited Allied invasion of Europe took place with virtually unopposed landings on the coast of Normandy. Under a massive air umbrella, the Allies managed to land 150,000 men and 500 tanks by day's end. Rommel's insistence that the invasion could only be defeated on the beaches vanished in the absence of a strong panzer force in proximity to the Normandy coast. This in turn, the consequence of a squabble within the high command in the west as to where the panzer should be stationed, as well as reflecting the long-held view that the Allied landings would take place in the Pas de Calais. Even after June 6, Allied misinformation would continue to reinforce the German belief that another landing was expected in that region. Even before D-Day, and certainly thereafter, Allied air power was employed to paralyse the movement of German traffic on the ground, with the Luftwaffe long swept from the skies in France. Once ashore, the Allied task was to reinforce the lodgment area, bringing over forces from England as soon as possible, so as to build up Allied strength to combat the inevitable German reinforcement in Normandy. German attacks on the 6th had been cursory. 21st Panzer Division had moved against the British Canadian landing beaches and received a bloody nose. On the following day, the 12th SS Panzer Division was in action against the Canadians, effectively blocking the drive to seize Caen, originally targeted for capture on D-Day itself. Ultimately, the battle for Caen would become the linchpin for the wider Battle of Normandy. As Allied forces moved inland off the beaches, they rapidly came up against one of the intractables of the campaign and to which little or no thought had been given in the planning stage of the invasion. If the Normandy beaches were chosen for their suitability for mass landings, the countryside inland from the beaches was ideal for defence. The hundreds of small fields, divided by centuries-old, high-banked and almost impenetrable hedges, punctuated by copses and small forests, known to the locals as the Bocage, made forward movement in the face of a spirited enemy extremely difficult. The Allied air campaign to halt the daylight movement of German reinforcements to Normandy, especially by the Panzer divisions, was no better illustrated than by reference to the travail of the Panzer Lea Panzer Division. As one of the most powerful armoured units in France, it was ordered to make for Caen on the 6th of June and travel in daylight. Due to the constant bombing and strafing from Allied aircraft, the forward units did not arrive until the 8th and the division was not fully in place until some days later. This experience was to become a common one, with divisions forced to travel at night and lay up in forests or under the trees in the daytime. The massive use of Allied air power for this purpose led to the extensive destruction of many towns and villages on the approaches to the Normandy battlefield. Along with the Tiger, the Panther was the most powerful tank in Normandy, with a total of 484 sent into action in June and July. In theory, the 1st Battalion of every Panzer regiment should have been equipped with Panthers, but this was not the case, with just seven out of the ten Panzer regiments in Normandy being so equipped, and with the majority of these belonging to the Waffen-SS. The bulk of Panthers in Normandy were the A model, with a smaller number of Gs and a few Panther Ds. The Allies rapidly came to fear the Panther. Although it fired a lighter shell than the 88mm gun of the Tiger, its extremely high muzzle velocity allowed it to take out any Allied tank at long range. Shermans, Cromwells and Churchills were all easy targets at a thousand yards. The vulnerability of Allied tanks to the Panther and Tiger nearly became a political scandal in the United Kingdom, with Field Marshal Montgomery having to intervene to insist that the threat posed by the German tanks was overblown and that Allied tanks were well up to the task expected of them. 
While such a view may have been acceptable for official consumption, Allied tank crews remained extremely sceptical. Many Allied tanks now began to carry extra armour in the form of welded-on track shoes. It was, however, discovered that a Panther could be killed by getting close enough to get in a shot on the lower part of the gun mantlet. The tank shell would then ricochet downward to break through the thinner hull top armour above the driver and machine gun operator. American tankers also discovered that a shell ricocheting off the ground in front of the Panther might penetrate the lower hull armour. As both these methods required the Allied tank to get well within the Panther's gun range, it took a brave crew to attempt such a tactic. Only the Sherman Firefly, a conversion undertaken by the British, whereby they replaced the low-velocity, short-barreled 75mm gun of the Sherman with a modified version of their own 17-pounder anti-tank gun, gave the Allies a tank that could penetrate the 18mm frontal armour of the Panther at combat ranges. Fireflies were issued on the basis of one per troop of four Shermans. Naturally, Panther commanders attempted to target the Fireflies first in any British tank attack the long 17-pounder barrel being a unique recognition feature. Tank crews often tried to disguise this so as to render the tank less obvious. Fireflies were successful in destroying panthers as is seen in the still of a knocked out Model A in the Odom Valley. Until the arrival of the American M26 with its 90mm gun just before the end of the war, the Firefly remained unique in its ability to take on and kill the big German cats. Even Panthers could not withstand the mighty explosive power or blast effect of the heavy shells lobbed in land onto German positions with unnerving accuracy by the heavy guns of naval vessels lying off the Normandy coast. With calibers ranging up to 16 inches, the effect of one of these shells falling alongside a Panther was enough to flip the 45-ton Panzer onto its back. Movement of German armour was very often targeted by such means with similar results. Fighting among the hedgerows was very much the opposite of the conditions for which the Panther was designed. The difficulty in moving in daylight meant that tanks in effect functioned as mobile pillboxes. In such circumstances the smokeless powder and very low muzzle flash of the Panther made it difficult to spot to oncoming Allied armour. Throughout the fighting in Normandy, most footage shows Panthers very heavily camouflaged with masses of foliage covering the machines. Indeed. The skillful provision of such became quite literally a matter of life and death for all panzers in Normandy. Even as the Allies were grinding down the German forces in Normandy, the propaganda ministry saw fit to show the comparative testing of a panther against an Allied tank even though that chosen was an M3 Lee, which was no longer serving in armoured divisions in Europe. Naturally enough, the footage clearly reveals the superiority of the Panther. One can only assume that the Ministry had determined that having seen this film, German civilians would go home to their beds confident that the fate of the Reich must be assured the army possessed such superior weapons. German veterans of the Normandy campaign always recall to their horror the overwhelming impact on ground operations of Allied fighter bombers. In particular, the RAF Typhoon, which carried eight 60-pound rockets, had an explosive power that could defeat even a Panther. Although only a single battalion of the Jag Panther served in Normandy, it made a very singular impression. Designed as a heavy tank destroyer, employing the Panther chassis, the Ag Panther mounted a version of the 88mm Pac-43 heavy anti-tank gun that also equipped the Tiger II heavy Panzer, which saw service in Normandy. The 88mm Pac-43 had been employed by the Army as an anti-tank weapon since 1943. Although large, heavy and cumbersome, its very high muzzle velocity was able to defeat any known Soviet and Allied tank at ranges of up to 3,000 metres. 
The fighting compartment of the Jag Panther had been designed by extending upward the side plates and upper hull of a standard Panther tank. Just 392 were produced in total, supply never being able to meet demand. Footage of these vehicles is very scarce, this Jag Panther being filmed on the Oda in 1945. This Jag Panther, found abandoned, minus its tracks, along with two others, had ambushed a squadron of Churchill tanks belonging to the 6th Guards Tank Brigade on the 30th of July in Normandy. Within the space of a few minutes, ten Churchills had been knocked out. In the melee, British tanks knocked out two of the German tank destroyers. Although German opposition remained fierce right through July and into August, the breakout of the American forces from the Cotentin Peninsula and the drive by Patton's Third Army across the rear of the German position in Normandy opened up the prospect of the Allies effecting an encirclement of the Army of the West. As the British battled south towards Falaise in the face of desperate German resistance, the Americans took Argenton. The Allied pincers did not close around Falaise until the 18th of August, and in that time, substantial German forces had slipped away. But most of the heavy equipment had been abandoned. Those German forces trapped in the pocket were subjected to heavy artillery and tank fire from British, Canadian and Polish forces on the northern edge of the encirclement. To the south, American forces delivered their own heavy bombardment. The Germans, however, continued to offer heavy resistance. Destruction within the pocket was mounting. As British and American fighter bombers also rocketed and strafed the panzers, lorries and horse-drawn wagons, parked end-to-end -end on the roads leading into Falaise. Very few of the panthers survived the destruction, and their fate, as abandoned, smouldering and blackened hulks, was recorded by Allied cameramen after the surrender of the German forces in the pocket. Those forces that did escape from Falaise now set off at speed to reach the same bridges. Surviving heavy equipment was nursed through the narrow roads whilst under constant attack from Allied fighter bombers. A few Panthers and these Jag Panthers of Battalion 654 escaped the pocket, but having reached the river, discovered that Allied aircraft had already destroyed the bridges, able to carry the weight of their heavy armoured vehicles. They were thus unable to cross. Only light vehicles could be taken across on the rafts or use the hastily constructed pontoon bridges. In such circumstances, the tank crews had little choice but to blow up their machines. It is only towards the end of the war that footage of the Panther in action becomes more common on newsreels. This is both a reflection of the greater number of these Panthers in service by this time and a marked decline in the numbers of Tiger Ones and the very small number of King Tigers serving in heavy tank battalions. These units had formerly been of particular interest to the propaganda department, as there had been a deliberate policy of depicting them to the German public as elite units. These Panther A's are some of the 60 on strength, with the Hermann Goring Panzer Corps when filmed in combat sometime between the 15th of October and the 4th of November 1944, when the Red Army launched its invasion of East Prussia by a thrust between the towns of Gumbinen and Goldap. The German response was to launch a limited concentric counterattack to seal off the Soviet drive into the East Prussian hinterland, with the Hermann Goring Corps and the 39th Panzer Corps thrusting into the flanks of the 11th Guards Army. In conditions of local air superiority, Luftwaffe Stukas proceeded to bomb the advancing Soviet armour, with the Panthers following with their own attack. While it is clear the Panthers inflicted heavy losses on the Russians, it must always be borne in mind that it was a feature of the propaganda function of newsreels that the PK camera teams never showed any destroyed German armour or dead German soldiers. Following the Soviet invasion of Romania by the forces of the 2nd and 3rd Ukrainian Front in August 1944, the limited armoured forces available to the Germans fought desperately in the face of the overwhelming strength of the Red Army. The destruction of the German 6th Army opened up the whole of Romania 
and the Hungarian plane to the rapidly advancing mobile forces of the Russians. The blunting of localised Soviet thrusts by Panther units could not, in the end, have any major impact on the wider picture, whatever the particular technical skills displayed by the crews in bringing them about. Throughout the late autumn of 1944, Panther units belonging to the 4th Panzer Army in southern Poland were in almost continual action against the ever-advancing Soviet forces. Almost all footage from this period reflects the continual cycle of retreat, regroup and limited counterattack to seal off local breakthroughs. If the Panther had a swan song on the Eastern Front, then it lay with those that participated in the series of aborted German attacks around Lake Balaton in Hungary between February and March of 1945. On the 18th and 19th of September 1944, units of the 5th Panzer Army, which was but a pale shadow of the strength implied by its designation, was directed to attack and seize the town of Luneville in the Moselle River in eastern France in order to stop the advance of Patton's 3rd US Army towards the German border. The few Panthers available for the attack, mainly Model Gs, came from the 112th Panzer Brigade. Although Luneville was taken, a subsequent attack on the US 4th Armoured Division was stopped with the loss of 50 tanks. This unique footage from Newsreel has captured an early recovery version of the Panther, towing an even rarer Jagd Panther. This abandoned Panther G clearly shows the one-piece armoured side plate characteristic of this model. What cannot be seen is the new rear deck design, the revised forward hull and deleted driver's hull flap, replaced by a periscope. The new chin gun mantlet is most prominent. 3,740 Model Gs were built by War's End. Although Hitler had expressed his desire to launch a major offensive in the West, even while his troops were still in retreat from France, it was only in October that full planning began. The intention was to drive two panzer armies through the weakly defended Ardennes, cross the river Meuse, and thereafter drive for Antwerp, splitting the US forces in France from the Anglo-Canadian forces in the Low Countries. This, Hitler believed, would force an Allied evacuation from the continent. Priority in the supply of all new Panthers was given to those units allocated to take part in the offensive. On December the 15th, the day before the offensive began, Panther strength stood at about 400 machines, out of a total of 1,200 tanks to be employed in the attack. Shortly after the opening of the offensive, given the somewhat prosaic title Autumn Mist, but better known to posterity as the Battle of the Bulge, 6th SS Panzer Army and 5th Panzer Army both reported early gains, as it was clear that the Allies had been taken by surprise. But progress rapidly slowed in the face of very poor conditions. Narrow, icy roads, fog and heavy snow, as well as stiffening resistance from American troops. By the 24th of December, 5th Panzer Army was making fair progress in the south, but further advance westward was hamstrung by a tenacious American defence at the town of Bastogne, which refused to surrender. On the 26th, a relief column from the US 3rd Corps relieved Bastogne. Von Rundstedt had already wanted to call the offensive off, but Hitler refused. And by the 28th, the German momentum was spent. Tanks were running out of fuel and being abandoned. The wooded countryside of the Ardennes with its opportunity for using cover, making it easy to stalk tanks, which is what many American tanks and tank destroyers did, was not the best environment for the Panther, which could not use its long-range gun to best effect. As the bulge contracted eastward under US and British pressure, the surviving Panthers carried out a fighting retreat. Although the Panther was undoubtedly the best medium tank in the battle, it was never available in sufficient numbers to cancel out the more numerous Allied armour. Even so, Allied losses amounted to a few thousand tanks and other vehicles, roughly 10% of the effective Allied strength in Europe at this time. In early January, with improving weather, the Allied fighter bombers were out in force and Panzer losses increased. By the time the offensive was closed down, nearly 200 Panthers had been written off to all causes. 
Total German losses in the Battle of the Bulge amounted to about 600 tanks. This late model Panther G, identifiable by its chin gun mantlet and raised engine fans on the rear deck, was knocked out by US forces at Houghton in Belgium on the 26th of December 1944. Unlike the previous Panther, which wore the ornate ambush camouflage scheme, the crew of this late Panther G made at least some attempt to whitewash their vehicle for the snowy conditions of the Ardennes. The blackened turret suggests that this Panther suffered a severe internal fire. This late Panther G was knocked out from the rear by a US Army tank destroyer, the subsequent internal fire being sufficiently fierce to weaken the torsion bars with the result that the suspension has collapsed. The fire has left the rest of the Panther a blackened hulk. The Allied advance into Germany from March 1945 was rarely opposed by any significant German forces. With the encirclement of the 5th Panzer Army, 5th Army and the remaining 19 divisions of Field Marshal Model's Army Group B in the rear pocket, very few Panzers were now available to offer concerted resistance. However, small ad hoc battle groups were encountered by the Allies, equipped with one or two Panthers, a surviving Tiger, or a self-propelled gun and crewed by die-hard soldiers, these would offer fierce local resistance until their fuel and ammunition ran out or they were destroyed. Other abandoned equipment littered the routes of advance, such as this Panther G being examined by a group of US soldiers. The crew had clearly made an attempt to deck out their tank with camouflage to give it some protection from the Allied fighter bombers that rove ahead of the advancing Allied columns flying at low level and shooting up anything deemed to be a threat. Here a late model Jag Panther, based on the Panther G chassis, has been knocked out by a US Army M36 tank destroyer. The M36, mounting a 90mm gun, was one of the few Allied vehicles that could penetrate both the frontal armour of the Panther and Jag Panther. One of the very rare Panther variants encountered by the advancing Allies was a late model Panther G using the steel road wheels derived from the Tiger II. The fire in this Panther has evidently collapsed the torsion bars leading to the pronounced droop at the rear of the tank. It was shortly before Goebbels closed down the cinemas in Germany and brought to an end the filming for the weekly newsreels in March 1945 that this footage of Panthers in action around Breslau was taken. All are late Model Gs and are painted in an unusual camouflage scheme. Supported by grenadiers and half-tracks mounting triple 30mm cannon, the Panthers advanced to engage oncoming Soviet armour. One Soviet tank, probably a T-3485, has been engaged and destroyed at fairly close range. The final Soviet offensive to capture Berlin opened before dawn on April 16, 1945, with a massive artillery barrage of 8,000 guns and rocket launchers. These were directed at the German positions on the Zalau Heights by the forces under the command of Marshal Georgi Zhukov. Further to the south, his great rival, Marshal Ivan Konyev, launched his own offensive by 1st Ukrainian Front some 75 minutes later. For three days, the Germans skillfully held off Zhukov's forces. The 88mm guns and panzer units of Panthers and King Tigers destroyed large numbers of Soviet tanks, the western banks of the Oder becoming a mass graveyard of shattered Russian armour. Zhukov, stung by comments from Stalin about the delay in his offensive timetable, lambasted his senior commanders and demanded a breakthrough at any cost. By the afternoon of the 19th, the heights have been stormed and the German forces overrun. The advance on Berlin now began in earnest. Overhead, the Red Air Force pounced on the retreating German columns streaming back towards Berlin. By the 25th of April, the city was completely encircled. 
A small number of panthers and other panthers lay within the city to contest the Soviet advance. As the Russians moved in medium and heavy armour in the shape of T-34s, JS-2s and supporting ISU-122 and 152 heavy assault guns. By the 30th, the Soviet 150th Division had fought its way to the Reichstag, which was defended to the last by fanatical troops from the SS, assisted by Volkssturm and Hitler Youth. At 22.50 hours, a small party of Soviet troops scaled the stairs to the roof of the Reichstag building and unfurled the flag in symbolic triumph for the USSR's victory over Nazi Germany. Hitler was dead, and on the 2nd of May, the Germans in the city surrendered. Berlin had fallen.